All right, well, it is good to be back. I brought a few pictures with me. Are we ready for those? Yes. All right, so this is the boat that we were on. So Tamara and I, Tamara concocted this little vacation with her twin sister. So this is Tamara and Melissa. Uh, can you tell which is which? Tamara would be on my right. Um, as you're looking at the picture, it's on the right. That's Tamara. Her twin sister Melissa is between me and her husband Scott. Uh, so it was our her 50th birthday, both of their 50th birthdays, and then it was our 25th anniversary. So we bought these tickets last year during COVID when it was super cheap. So it was really, it was really cheap. It was wonderful. So the boat we were on was called the Norwegian Epic. This was our itinerary. We flew into Barcelona. Uh, then we went across the Mediterranean to Ajaccio, which is on the island of Corsica, which is where Napoleon grew up. And that island is governed by the country of France. And then from there we went to Civetia, which is the port for the city of Rome. Uh, but it took about 90 minutes to get from the port into Rome via a big old bus. So that was fairly disappointing because it meant we only had a few hours in uh, the country of Rome, or the city of Rome. But we uh, purchased tickets in advance to go to the Vatican Museum so we could see the Sistine Chapel. And it was absolutely stunning. Uh, it was also absolutely hot because they do not have cold air conditioning in Europe. They have air conditioning, at least that's what they call it, but it is set for like 86. <laughs> you know? so you come in, you're like, I think I feel cold, but I really don't. I'm like, they need some Americans here to help these people out. From Rome, we went down to Naples. At Naples, we actually didn't go to the city of Naples, we went to the Amalfi Coast. Saw a few cities of the Greek stars and people cities, and then came back and toured uh, the ruined city of Pompeii at the base of Mount Vesuvius. That was super cool. Then we got back on the boat, went up to Florence, or the port name is Livorno, and we did not go into Florence, we went to Pisa. We had purchased tickets in advance to climb the Tower of Pisa, which we did. That was super fun. Um, and then we went from there to a city called Cannes, which is in French, uh, France, on the coast there. They have like that film festival there. Eh, I could give, give a take that city. Then we went to this island called Palma, Mallorca that I mentioned. I've never even heard of it, but it's a big old island south of Spain. Beautiful, that was really beautiful. And then we ended up um, back in Barcelona. And so I brought a few pictures here. Uh, interestingly, when, when I got to Corsica, the very first thing I saw was a was this beautiful calendar here. So I brought this for Chris Anderson. But he's not here today. And we watch his video, hoping he can enjoy this. Burrows were, were everywhere I went in, in Europe. So just to let you know, everywhere we went, we saw donkeys. Not that these are donkeys. This is actually <laughs> the, the Camp Larcata. At the very end of our trip, we were able to uh, take a day and drive up. Tamara had to drive his I don't drive stick shift car. And that's all they have over there in, in Europe is stick shift cars. So, um, we were able to see David Sandy. This is Dan, one of the guys. This is the camp director. I had a great time visiting with them at Marcotta. And the camp was full of kids, uh, and they were just uh, bouncing with joy because the previous week was their first week of camp, and like some like 20 kids had gotten saved in professions of faith at the camp, and they were on cloud nine. And the camp was full of campers again, and they just couldn't wait to see what was going to happen. We, we were there the first full day of camp, so they were just kind of getting started getting to know the kids. But it was fun to get there to uh, spend some time with them and to, uh, and to pray with them and encourage them. It was really great to see them. And I, all these years that we've supported Marcotta, I've not had a chance to go. So it's my first time ever going to the camp. And boy, it was, everything they talk about is what they were doing. There are kids all over. They were, we went to each of the athletic fields. We went to the American football field. They had a bunch of kids lined up and running plays in the first day of camp. Uh, then went to volleyball uh, courts, the basketball courts where they had volleyball nets up. Kids everywhere playing volleyball, and then we had this beautiful new pool, and at the pool was the cheerleading camp, which doubled from last year to this year. And then there were American coaches in each of these sports teaching the kids how to play, how to do the sports the way Americans do, which is what the, is the draw for the kids. So it was really neat to see. And of course, they sleep in the TVs, and that's pretty cool too. So it was really neat to see David City. All right, so we are in the book of Daniel. So grab your Bibles, go to Daniel chapter 7. All right, so instead of reading Daniel 7, I have a video that we're going to watch. It's a dramatic reading. So grab your Bibles, open to Daniel chapter 7. This uh, chapter of Scripture opens us into the prophetic chapters of the book of Daniel, where God literally writes history in advance. 
We're going to see it, a taste of it today, and we're going to get it more in the next five chapters of Daniel, where God tells us exactly what's going to happen in the future, and we have the beauty of hindsight, right? Daniel wrote 700 years before Christ was even born. We have the beauty now we're almost 3,000 years later to look back and see how God not only was accurate, but how, how accurate he was in the details. We're really going to see it in the next couple of chapters. This chapter is kind of a broad overview of history that God gives to Daniel. And then the next couple of chapters, he's going to be even more specific with what happens, especially with Alexander the Great. Here we have what's called the vision of the four beasts. All right, if you look out from our map, uh, we are in that second circle right now. Daniel has been pulled from Jerusalem. He's in Babylon. Now, this particular chapter is, you know, Daniel is not laid out chronologically, right? So the Bible will tell us when this first vision occurs. All right, so it occurs actually when, uh, who's the guy with the handwriting on the wall? Belshazzar. So this, this is the guy that's the king during this vision. So we're still in Babylon, we're not in Susa, but we're going to get there when the Medes and Persians takes over, uh, take over, and Daniel is over there in Susa. All right, is this the right screen for the video? Mm -hmm. Oh, we'll be in discussion. Okay, here's a great question. Why does God include prophecy in Scripture? Open question, why? Why does God include prophecy? Yeah, to give us an idea of what's going to happen in the future. So we can be prepared, absolutely, right? Especially when we get, especially when we get in the tribulation period, prophecy is there to help the people that are still here. Most of us will be gone. Bryce will still be here. But when the rapture occurs, <laughs> most of us will go. Those who want to stay for the rest and be persecuted will stay with Christ. Just give it, you can will your stuff to him. He still wants to be here. But, but especially for those who will go through that horrific period of time, Bible prophecy will be a comfort to them because they know what's coming next. But why else? Freedom. Are you just putting your, uh, your, yeah, well, when you do that, you raise both hands. So I thought for sure you had a very good input. Dra dramatic double input. But she was just putting her hands on her sweater. To prove his deity, absolutely. To prove that he is God. Because who else can predict the future other than God? Absolutely. I mean, all right. Why does he only predict some future events, but not all future events? You know, so God only gives us prophecy about a few things. So why is he selective what he gives us? Both are, well, you both are saying the right thing just two different ways. So Peggy say it because Daniel tells us the other book. Say it again. We're not supposed to know it all, right? But Karen's input is exactly right. Say it again. Only what he gives us what we can handle. I mean, can you imagine if he put everything? No, no. He, he gives us what he wants to give us. He gives us what we need, right? But if you look at prophecy, he really only gives prophecy about a certain period of times, and then when it gets towards the end, he gives all kinds of detail about the last seven years. But again, why does he do that, Barb? To prepare those people who are going to be going through that so they know what's going to be next. They can handle it, they can last. Right? All right. So, this vision, we talked about this, occurs chronologically between Daniel's chapter 4 and 5, right? Based on the king. We know that because of uh, the video here. Let's uh, turn the volume up. Let's watch this video here. Now, follow along in your Bible. Daniel 7, King James. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. 2. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Verse 4. The first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Verse 5. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said, 
thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Verse 6. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong seed, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and had ten horns. Verse 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn, for eyes like the eyes of men, and a mouth speaking great things. Verse 9 I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Verse 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. Verse 11. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed, and given to the burning flame. Verse 12. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. Verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. Verse 14. And there was given him dominion, and glory, and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Okay, that's a pretty fascinating vision, huh? Anybody had a dream like that? <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty amazing dream, right? And Daniel recounts every word of the dream, right? He writes it down because he just can't get it out of his head. And here's the beauty of scripture. We don't have to wonder what this dream meant, right? Now, this is the book of Daniel. How many dreams have we already been through in our book? At least two for so far, right? And who's had the who's had the dreams so far? The kings have had the dreams, right? Now this dream is given to Daniel himself, all right? So who gets to interpret? Who has interpreted the previous dreams? Daniel has, right? He's been given the interpretation. Now who's going to interpret this dream? Yeah, it's going to be an angel, all right? Let's look, let's follow in our Bibles and read the rest of the chapter. We're going to read the interpretation of the dream, then we're going to go back and talk about it. All right? We don't have to wonder what it matters, we don't wonder what it means, because God's going to tell us exactly what it means. Verse 15. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was deeply distressed within me, and the visions in my mind terrified me. You know, I, scripture is funny, because you get one little sentence, all right? But God is scared to death, right? Can you imagine seeing what you've seen? Just, I love this dramatic reading. I mean, he does a great job of, in images that they give us, which could have been what he saw. Right? But the guy's scared to death. I mean, you would be too. Ever, anyone had a nightmare before? This is, a, this is a nightmare, right? He approaches one of those who were standing by. Now, this is fascinating. So he sees this vision. He's not the only one seeing the vision. There's other people standing by. Well, who are these people standing by? 
These are likely angels. This isn't people. This is one of those things. But this is an angel watching this vision, which to me is really interesting. <laughs> he's having a dream. He's having a vision. He's not the only one there. Right? There's an angel in there. At least one. Probably more because it says one of those standing by. Fascinating. I asked him the true meaning of all of this, so evidently this was a male angel. He let me know the interpretation of these things, and here it is. These huge beasts, four in number, are four kings who will arise from the earth. But I love the, and the angel is not worried about this at all. But he just he just swats it aside, right? He's gonna take hundreds of years of human history and just go, eh, eh. But the holy ones of the Most High will receive the kingdom and possess it forever. Yes, forever. The angel isn't concerned at all about the details of human history. They live outside of time. They look at this. We're going to see this. This covers hundreds of years, thousands of years of human history. And the angel's like, yeah, all this stuff's going to happen. But by the way, the saints win at the end and they get the kingdom forever. I just love that summary verse. If you're ever concerned about the details of what's going on in the world around you, you can read this verse right here. Yeah, verse 18. Yeah, but the Holy Ones live and get the name of forever. Right? You don't need to be worried about the details of what's going on on this earth. Verse 19. Daniel is still concerned. He hears the angel's explanation. All right, it's about kingdoms. You're, you're getting prophecy of the kingdoms, and Daniel's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But something about that fourth beast in the dream really scared him. And so he asks the angel, um, a little bit more about the fourth beast. <laughs> could, you, could you just give me a little bit more information about this one? All right? Then I want to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, the one different from all the others. <clears throat> Extremely terrifying, with iron teeth and bronze claws, devouring, crushing, and trampling with its feet whatever was left. I also want to know about the ten horns on its head and about that other horn that came up before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke arrogantly and that was more visible than the others. And as, as I was watching, this horn waged war against the Holy Ones and was prevailing over them until the ancient of days arrived and a judgment was given in favor of the Holy Ones of the Most High. For the time had come and the Holy Ones took possession of the and this is what he said. The fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, but different from all the other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth, trample it down, and crush it. The ten horns are ten kings who will arise from this kingdom. Another, different from the previous ones, will arise after them and subdue three of the kings. He will speak words against the Most High and oppress the Holy Ones of the Most High. He will intend to change religious festivals and laws, and the Holy Ones will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. But the court will convene, and his dominion will be taken away to be completely destroyed forever. The kingdom, dominion, and greatness of the kingdoms under all of heaven will be given to the people, the Holy Ones of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will serve and obey him. This is the end of the interpretation. As for me, Daniel, <laughs> my thoughts terrified me greatly and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. I just love Daniel. He's like, I had a horrific nightmare. He gets the interpretation from an angel, and the Marian is like, God yeah, was terrified. <laughs> Look, the Bible can only give us the words that he's written down. We do get the explanation, the, the, uh, the emotion, the meaning behind this. I mean, of course he was terrified, he kept it to himself, but he writes it down, and we have it forever, Dr. Here in God's Word. Now, we're going to go back and we're going to look at what we have seen here in Daniel, all right? All right. Describe the imagery surrounding the initial setting of the vision. So let's go back to Daniel as the opening part of this, this vision. What, would, what do you see here? How would you describe the initial setting of this four beasts? Scripture words. How would you describe it? Dark. This is a dark, foreboding setting, right? We have this four winds of heaven. So you see this incredible wind blowing over the great sea, right? And what is the great sea? Yeah. In in their um, in their time, that sea would have been the Mediterranean Sea, right? 
but it's a picture, right? In, in prophetic apocalyptic scripture, it's a picture of mankind. So you see this human history, mankind, and you see this turbulence of the kingdoms of mankind, right? Exactly the turbulence we experience in the world right today, in the world right today, right? And then we see these mutant beasts, right? These strange mutant beasts coming out of this chaos, all right? That's, in my opinion, the description of a nightmare. If you try to sleep and this is coming in your mind, all right, this is scary, scary stuff, all right? Now, if you if you look at the description of these beasts and we go back to Daniel chapter 2, we're going to see this parallel between the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw and the four kingdoms that he saw in his image of that statue along with these four beasts. It's going to be a parallel. It's just going to be a different when Nebuchadnezzar saw it, what did he see? What was his vision of? This beautiful statue made out of what? Gold and iron and bronze and silver. This, this beautiful, right, from mankind's perspective, these wonderful kingdoms that are going to be ruled. I think it was the ruler of the head, head of, of gold, right? But when you get God's perspective on these same kingdoms, what is the description? Waves, turbulence, chaos, and mutant beasts. All right? Looking at the world's kingdoms, the mankind kingdoms, uh, is not the beauteous image that we often think that it is from God's perspective. Right? We see a winged lion when his wings get ripped off. Right? You see this bear that leans up on its side and it's destroying and trampling ribs in its mouth, with this leopard with four wings and four heads, and, and then this. Beast that we can't even even be sure what the picture of it is, right? Daniel can't even describe it. He's so awed and fearful of it, right? Let's keep looking. So here's the first beast we get. It's this lion with eagle's wings, and its wings get plucked, and a human mind is given to it. Well, what is the interpretation? What, what kingdom is this? This is Nebuchadnezzar, right? This is Babylon. This is right where Daniel lives, right? Daniel has lived through this already. Now this vision is given under Belteshazzar, so Nebuchadnezzar has lived and died. But in this image, the very first beast that he sees is his friend Nebuchadnezzar, right? This amazing lion who's ruling the world. And he had wings, and he went over, he conquered the whole world, but what happened to his wings? He got ripped off. So what is that a picture of? You guys remember? What happened to Nebuchadnezzar? He went insane. Remember? Why did he go insane? Pride. Pride. Right. He put himself above God himself. And God said, uh, I'm check out. I'm gonna make you like an animal to yourself. Right? And then he gets finally gets restored, his human mind is getting back to him. But how long was he insane? Eating grass like an ox? Seven years. Imagine having a president that didn't have his mind for seven years? I don't know how we can imagine that. It's so far fetched. <laughs> Sorry. I couldn't help it. I'm sorry. We're going to make it edit that out. I'm not making it. I'm not making it. I'm just saying. There's things in scripture that we, that we can relate to. All right. But I mean, he lost his mind and it was restored to him. And that's the first piece. All right. All right. I'm right, right, moving on. All right. Get to the second beast, right? And the second beast is a bear raised up on one side with three ribs in its mouth, just tearing things apart. All right, so this didn't happen yet in Daniel's lifetime. This was still prophecy for Daniel, all right? But very soon, right, Belteshazzar is ruling when what happens? We already covered it in class. What happens? There's a hand that shows up, writes on the wall. What does he tell him? Your days are numbered, my friend. And it's that night, right, where the, where the Persians and the Medes come in, take over the city of Babylon, go on to conquer the world, or the known world at the time. Uh, by the way, the Persians will surpass the Medes in power, which is why the bear is there and then it raises up on one side. The picture of that is that the Medo-Persian Empire became strong. Uh, the Persians kind of overcame the Medes. One of those, one side of that 
combined empire was stronger than the other. That's why the bear raises up, it's a lopsided bear. And then he has three ribs in his mouth, and most commentators say that the Persians went on to surpass and defeated both Babylon, Lydia, which is part of Turkey, and then Egypt. So as they conquered the known world, they conquered these three main uh, powers that were in the world at the time, which is why you have three ribs. Right? This had not happened, this will happen in the prophetic future for Daniel. We have the beauty of looking back on history and seeing how this was fulfilled. This, by the way, also parallels the silver chest of Nebuchadnezzar's statue. All right, then we get to this next beast, this leopard, all right? Well, what do we know about a leopard? Just describe what a leopard is. Fast, right? A leopard is a super fast cat, right? This leopard had four wings of a bird, again, implying not only is it a fast cat, but it's even faster. Right? It's, it's whatever it is, it's super fast, this animal. And he had four heads. Now, when we look back at history, we see how this was fulfilled. This is the kingdom of Greece. Right? Fulfilled in Alexander the Great, he conquered the known world unbelievably fast and then died at the age of 33. And when he died, well, just guess what happened in his kingdom? It was split, he had no heirs, it was split between his four generals. Right? These four generals each took four different areas of the world and ruled over those, Macedonia, Asia Minor, Syria, and Egypt. And you get decades of human history running through these four uh, kingdoms that came out of the Greek Empire. By the way, this was, this was all setting up the first coming of Jesus Christ. Right? The Greek influence on the world through Alexander the Great, he conquers everything. And the Greek influence starts to spread across the entire world of time. This is right before Jesus comes on the scene, right? It's Greek influence. Which, by the way, if you go to Europe today, you still see the Greek influence everywhere. All right, that's the third beast, literally fulfilled. We look back in hindsight, we can see how this was fulfilled. And then we get to this fourth beast. And this is kind of a, sorry, a comical character, but I couldn't find anything that was out there that could depict what he saw. This is the best I could find because it had 10 horns on its head. But whatever it was, it was dreadful and terrifying. It had iron teeth and ten horns. All right, looking back at human history, we know what this kingdom was and what kingdom was it. This is the kingdom of Rome. Rome that comes in and conquers Greece, conquers the entire known world at the time, spreads all the way into Western Europe, all the way uh, to Spain, uh, up in Europe, and all the way across North Africa, all the way to the Horn, uh, where Gibraltar is. So all the way around the Mediterranean Sea, Rome conquers everything. Rome starts to build roads, and Rome, the iron of Rome, represents what in Rome? What is Rome known for with iron? Their armies, right? The armies of Rome, which wore iron, and their chariots, where they conquered everything with iron. So this is Rome, right? We don't get a specific animal, just dread and fear. This corresponds to that fourth, the legs of the... Of the uh, Nebuchadnezzar's statue, right? And the horns represent authority and leaders. Here we see a two-part um, pro prophetical vision here. We see this, we know that Rome is part of the, of, the, of the interpretation because Rome fulfilled this. But there is more in this, in this vision that has not yet been fulfilled. There is still a future fulfillment here, which often happens in prophecy, right? Jesus Christ came, they were looking for the Messiah to come, but they didn't realize he was going to come in two parts. His first coming as the Prince of Peace, and the second coming as the King, right? The King coming in judgment. This prophecy again gives us the same thing. Rome defined that fourth kingdom, but there is still a future fulfillment here where we get all of this detail about this fourth kingdom that has not yet happened. All right? Well, we're going to get into that. All right? But before we do, let's look at the Ancient of Days coming. This is beautiful. Let me scripture here. Let's look at it. Verses 9 through 12, we get a complete change of scenery. All right, so we move away from this chaotic, turbulent scene, and we see this beautiful scene. Now we're in heaven, and we see thrones set into place, right? We see the Ancient of Days taking his seat. His clothing is white like snow, the hair of his head like white as wool, 
his throne flaming fire, its wheels blazing fire, a river of fire flowing coming out from his presence, thousands upon thousands serving him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was convened and the books were opened. How did you guys? What do we see in this scene here? How does this description reveal his character? Absolutely, you see judgment. What else do we see? Contrast it with what we saw in the vision of the beast. You see light, absolutely, because God is light. The scene is completely flipped. It's a hundred day difference between the focus on man and the focus on God. You see light. What else do we see? You see worship, right? We didn't see worship in that first scene. We saw chaos. You see worship, absolute worship. Thousands upon thousands and 10,000 upon 10,000. Who is this? This is God Almighty. This is the Ancient of Days is God Almighty with the saints surrounding him, worshiping him, and angels worshiping him. This is heaven. This is the beautiful scene. Can you imagine Daniel's? Oh. A little relief here, this part of the, of the, of the dream. How do you describe, how is God described here? <coughs> what the word Jesus? How is he described? Peace. No chaos here. What about his physical being? Powerful. Absolutely. You see, a, you, you see abject power. No question about who's in control here. You see absolute authority. What else? How is he described? White as snow. So what are we, what's the parallel? What are we talking about? Purity. Abject purity as opposed to the sinfulness of mankind. The sinfulness of kingdoms. The sinfulness of politicians. Right? Is this issue here fire? Yes, that there is fire involved here. We have both whiteness, but then we have fire. Right? And what is that description? It's the description that there is healthy fear of whoever this is. But also, what does it describe? What's coming? Say again? Hell, absolutely. That there is judgment getting ready to be placed upon the upon the Right? His hair like the whitest wool. His throne is flaming fire. This is no one to be trifled with. This is not a human king. This is God Almighty. <coughs> Then we're introduced to a new character, verse 13 and 14. And who, do we, who are we introduced to? Yeah, somebody called the Son of Man. Right now, we're in the Old Testament, right? Jesus had not been revealed yet. This is Jesus. We just don't know his name. Now, we do. We have the benefit of hindsight. But Daniel didn't know his name was Jesus. Daniel gives us this description. One like a Son of Man. By the way, it says he comes riding in the clouds of heaven. That imagery would have been familiar to the Jewish readers. From the book of Psalms, from the book of Isaiah. Who is it that comes on the clouds? Who is it that ascended into the clouds? And said, so I will come back to say when you saw me. This is Jesus. No question about it. Believers, we know who this is. Daniel didn't have his name, but we know who it is. This is Jesus coming. Jesus comes. By the way, what did Jesus call himself 69 different times in the Gospels? The Son of Man. Jesus chooses this title. Why he chooses this title? Because that's a title given in the prophetic scripture. He takes it right in by the book of Daniel chapter 7. And again, those Jewish religious leaders would have known Daniel chapter 7. They would have known that Jesus is intentionally taking this title, claiming himself to be this very person. I saw one like a son of man coming to the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. Escorted before the presence of God the Father. He was given authority to rule and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Does this sound like the book of Revelation to you? 
recall this is over and over in the book of Revelation as John gets additional revelation in the New Testament hundreds of years later after Daniel lives and dies. Scripture interpreting scripture. All right, then we get the interpretation. All right, here's the quick summary. Interesting, as he gives an interpretation, he gives an interpretation of what these beasts are, we get a little bit more information as the Bible will focus more on the fourth beast. Why does the Bible focus more on the fourth beast? Yes, because the fourth beast will be, will be fulfilled in two parts. We've already seen historically that Rome existed as an empire, right? That it fulfilled the fourth beast, but there's more to this fourth beast. We get more information about the fourth beast because it will have future fulfillment as well, right? With the Antichrist kingdom. All right, because we see this iron teeth, claws, a bronze, ten horns, and then this strange horn with eyes and a mouth, this weird fixation on this weird horn that talks and boasts and supplants three of the other horns. None of that, by the way, has happened yet. We just hang on. The horn also wages war with the saints and overpowers them for a season by the world. Daniel's probably like, what's going on here? And for a time, times and half a time, which by the way, saints, is three and a half years, which completely correlates exactly with the prophecies in the book of Revelation. So here we know John is also given this vision in Revelation about this horn, right? This antichrist. This horn is a person. He is a future world leader, and this world leader will be destroyed forever. We get all this in the book of Daniel. And scripture interprets scripture, we're going to see all of this in Revelation chapter 13 and 19. So you got to turn there. Let's turn there. Turn your Bibles. As we see scripture interpreting scripture, and we see exactly the plan of God that he sets up for the future and for the end of our current world. This age will end. This world will end. And we're getting very close. Revelation 13, verse 1. I saw a beast coming out of the sea. Anybody recognize where this imagery is coming from? Directly from Daniel chapter 7. He had ten horns and seven heads. All right, we've already heard about the ten horns, have we not? We just read about it in Daniel chapter 7. We don't know about these seven heads. On his horns are ten crowns, and on his heads are blasphemous names. This tells us the character of this person. All right? Blasphemous names. This is an evil, ungodly man. The beast I saw, now look how John describes this beast, right? This is hundreds of years, hundreds of years after Daniel. Look how John describes the beast he sees. It was like a leopard, and his feet like a bear's, and his mouth like a lion's mouth. Sound familiar? This is Daniel chapter 7. An amalgamation of all of those earthly kingdoms. This last guy who's going to come and rule will rule the world. All the kingdoms before him are shadows of what he will rule. All right? We get the source of his power. What's the source of his power here? Verse 2. The dragon. Who's that? Satan. So Satan is the ultimate authority behind this guy. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. One of his heads appeared to be fatally wounded, but his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. So in the future, this world leader will appear to be assassinated, but he will recover from the assassination, mimicking what event? The resurrection, crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is going to claim to be the Messiah. He's going to have a pseudo-death and resurrection. Right? Because he's going to claim to be the son. He will fool the world, will he not? Those who are not saved. But scripture tells us those who are living at the time, they'll know exactly who he is. We know what's going to happen. When they watch it on CNN, which they will do, the world will watch it. Bryce, you may be here to watch this. When you watch it on CNN, I'll be out again with the Raptors, but when Bryce stays, you'll get to watch this on MSNBC, right? Fox News may still exist, who knows, there's a few reasons or anything. They, that network might fold. And it's already fulfilled. But you can watch it. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. This guy will have satanic authority, satanic power, and will appear to be the Messiah. 
Verse 4, look who gets worshipped, by the way. Who gets worshipped? Satan. That the Satan ultimately is going to get the, the, uh, the win here. They worship the dragon because he gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war against him? He will be the ultimate world leader. He will be the world leader that has brought peace and safety. Peace and safety this world so desperately is clamoring for. Peace and safety by which is being talked about all the movies right now. So just had a president over there getting ready to sign peace agreements. We're going to bring you peace and safety. Saudi Arabia will sign the peace accords. We just simply need to split the country of Israel and give the Palestinians their capital each Jerusalem. We'll divide God's land and we'll bring you peace and safety. Peace and safety. Read the headlines the last two days. A mouth was given to him to speak boasts and blasphemies. Isn't that exactly what Daniel said the little horn was going to do? He was also given authority to act for 42 months. How long was 42 months? Oh, three and a half years? Would that be a time, time, and half a time? This is Daniel 7. The last three and a half years of this world. He began to speak blasphemies against God, to blaspheme his name and his dwelling, those who dwell in heaven. And he was permitted. Now, Satan gives him this authority, right? That's what we read. But ultimately, who's in control? God. Completely in control. He was permitted. He's allowed, right, for a period of time. God will use him to bring judgment. He was permitted to wage war against the saints and to conquer them. He was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. And all those who live on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name was what? Was not written. From the foundation of the world, the book for the life of the land who was slaughtered. Who will worship this guy? Everyone whose name is not written in the of life. So those who do not know Christ will worship this false Christ. Praise the Lord that we know Christ. And we are told all of this in advance. So much detail about this final world leader, world ruler. Why are we given so much detail? Because when he rules and reigns, it will be hell. Earth. And the saints, people who do get saved during this time, will have hope. They'll know it's only for a short period of time. Maybe they can just hold out. Although many of them will be martyred. All right, that's, oh, let's keep finish well, verse 10. If anyone has an ear, he should listen. If anyone is destined for captivity, into the captivity you will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with a sword, you will be killed. This demands the perseverance and faith of the saints. The saints who are alive, who get saved during these tribulation days, who are, will have to outlast, and many of them will be killed. And the Bible tells them, if you're going to be killed, you're going to be killed. It's a short period of time. All right? This time is not for them. This time is for judgment on the world. All right, now let's move to Revelation 19, just a few pages over. Revelation 19, verses 11 to 21. A scripture interprets scripture, and as God gives us hope for the future. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 to 21, let's read the end of this period of time. Daniel has seen all of this as you come back next couple weeks and we go into, into more detailed prophecy as God lays out exactly what's going to happen. Right, we can trust that these prophecies are true. The first four beasts, the first three of the four beasts, we have seen that happen just as described in human history. The fourth beast, we saw the first part of the interpretation come through with the Roman Empire. But this is yet to occur, coming out of the revived Roman Empire. All right? This is the end, verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and who do we see? Jesus. What's he riding? A white horse. We see this description again. Look at the words, look at the colors involved here every time we introduce Jesus. All right? In Daniel chapter 7, Jesus' title is what? The Son of Man, right? The Son of Man. We get some idea that there's humanity involved somewhere, all right? And we know when Jesus comes, he is divine and adds humanity to himself. All right? I can explain that to you, but we know that's what happened. All right? Now we see there's a white horse. Those of you wondering, are there animals in heaven? The answer is yes. It's rider. Look at the titles of this guy. Faithful and true. 
faithful and true. And he judges and he makes war with righteousness. His eyes are like a fiery flame and many crowns were on his head. And he had a name written that no one knows except himself. Fascinating. We need to learn a new name when we get to heaven. We don't know what it is yet. He wore a robe stained with blood, and his name is the Word of God. In the beginning was the, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is Jesus Christ. The armies that were in heaven, this will be us, the saints coming back. Uh, Christ will pick you up on the way. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword comes from his mouth that he might strike the nations with it. He will shepherd them with an iron scepter. He will trample the winepress and the fierce anger of God the Almighty. He has a name written on his robe and on his thigh. Jesus has a tattoo. King of kings and Lord of lords. This is the Son of Man that Daniel saw in Daniel chapter 7. We know him. This is not the meek and mild Jesus, the gentle and lowly Jesus that we saw coming the first time. This is Jesus saying, Enough is enough. Is enough. This is the Father pulling the belt out, <laughs> saying, Enough's enough. All right? <laughs> and you don't get whipped by your dads with a belt. I did. All right? And when enough was enough, and the Father came in, Get ready to set things straight. This is the end. By the way, it keeps going. I saw an angel standing on the sun. Well, that's got to be a pretty, a pretty strong angel to stand on the sun. <laughs> he cried out loud, voicing all the birds flying overhead, come and gather for the great supper of God. They're going to eat the flesh of kings, commanders, mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of everyone both free, slave, Small and great. You know, when Tam and I were walking through the ruins of Pompeii, that city was buried instantly. Flash heat, so the people died quickly, and then covered in ash. You know, they died. I mean, you see the pictures of Pompeii, and I walked through some of the houses of Pompeii that marble the houses on Tierra Verde, right? These massive houses that had vineyards within them. Beautiful homes. You can still see the colored tile. Uh, if I show you the pictures, colored tile. Looks like, uh, if you see mosaics of tiles today, it's exactly what they have. Still there, completely preserved by the ash. But they all died together. Small, great, rich, free, slaves, slave owners. They all died together. That's a picture here of Armageddon. Then I saw the beast. All right, this is the Antichrist. The kings of the earth and the armies gathered to wage war. Can you imagine how prideful they are? They decide they're going to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army coming down from heaven. How deceived you have to be that you can take on Jesus coming back with the armies of heaven. But the beast was taken prisoner, along with him the false prophet. How oh, they take these guys alive? Who had performed the signs of his presence. He deceived those who accepted the mark of the beast. Right? Why is it called the mark of the beast? This imagery goes all the way back to Daniel 7. If you wonder why it's called the beast, it's Daniel 7. Those who worshipped his image with these signs, both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. Anyone ever been out to um, Yellowstone? Yeah? You ever walked along those boardwalks of Yellowstone and smelled the sulfur coming out of the volcanic pits? Ugh, it bubbles up. It, you get close and it stinks. It smells like rotten eggs. You can't be there for very long. Shoots up in the air. This is a picture of hell. The rest were killed with the sword that came from the mouth and right of the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. It doesn't go well when you defy God. It just doesn't go well for you. Right? Praise the Lord that He has <clears throat> shown us His mercy and grace and allowed us to become saved. That we can read this passage of Scripture and understand it is old. Only the gift of the Holy Spirit. This chapter is awesome, and it's only going to get better. When we continue to go through the rest of this book of Daniel, and we see how God predicts the future and how accurate 
obedience, right down to the minutia detail that he just gives us. But what we see in Daniel chapter 7 is not only a prediction of the past, we see it a prediction of the future. And I believe it here. When you now see the very countries that are going to be involved in the war of Gog and Magog next Saturday. They met Saturday in Iran, Russia, Turkey and Iran. Oh, they just met Saturday in Iran. Dude, this is, this is the final alliance getting together and planning their assault. By the way, we know where they go. We know how it all ends. Scripture lays it all out for us. It's, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful time to be alive. All right, but what, we, what do we do with this? What do we do with this, guys? We should warn others. We know what's coming. We know what's coming. Now, it could be another hundred years. I don't think so. It could be. They both were terrorists. Could be another. Well, we'll could, see. Could be another 10,000 years. Could be another 10,000 years if you have a faulty you know, sense of understanding. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what we should do. We should go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creatures, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's exactly what we should do. And Teaching them what God's word says. Right? And this is part of what God's word says. Be aware of what's coming. Right? So, what do we do with it? We share the news. If we bring Daniel 7 later, read it to somebody. Send it to somebody. Think about this. Start a conversation over lunch. You ever read this? This is amazing stuff. Did you know that God's word predicted the future? It's cool stuff. All right. Daniel 7. It's good. And this is good stuff. Stuff. All right, next week, Daniel Lake. We can come back to Daniel Lake. All right, now we have prayer questions in the back. Where's Mandy? She's uh, universal. She, uh, oh, she's at a pagan theme park? Yeah. I'm <laughs> 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 just kidding. Uh, not really. She's yeah. there with the family. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, she'll, be, she'll hear this on the video, so she'll be able to get in class, which she's not here. I just so, wanted to let the class know that Tracy did text me this morning and thanked everyone for the card. Oh, wonderful. Okay, you're very good. Thanks, guys, for doing that. So let's make sure we uh, put prayer requests on back. Are the sheets back there, Brett? Yes, they are. Okay, great. Make sure we put prayer requests up. There's a lot to be prayed for. You guys need to pray for Beth Smith. She uh, just can't seem to kick uh, the cellulitis that she's got. She has been and wanted to come back week after week, and then she just gets ends up back in rehab. It's driving her crazy. Uh, for wheelchair Tom and Joseph, who was here for a couple weeks, same thing with Tom. He's doing this crazy bout of cellulitis that keeps, keeps him away. He might have to go back to rehab. He's really disappointed about that. So we be praying for those. Who else should we be praying for? A lot of great stuff too. I mean, Barb, sixty years. That's amazing. Yes, Barb. Yeah, my friend Tom. Tom, yes. Okay. All right. So, so Barb's neighbor and friend Tom. We've been praying for with his tongue cancer going back to uh, Texas, Houston, probably. Going today. So we be praying for that family. Oof. My uh, Katrina, you know, just recently lost her mother. I don't know if we shared that yet in class. So just be praying for her as she mourns, you know, the loss of her mom and uh, so soon the loss of her grandmother. Just a lot going on in her life. And, you know, Karen's just come back from burying her beloved husband. So just, you know, this world stinks sometimes. But it's also really great, right? I mean, God wants us to live and live more abundantly. But there's, there's pain in this life. Chad just lost his beautiful dog. Uh, one of his super faithful companions who's been, I think God has blessed him by giving him extra time <coughs> that probably wouldn't have happened, but now his beautiful doggy passed. It's a super painful loss for Chad. Um, still, life can be difficult. And she's good. Praise the Lord. So answer to prayer there. Uh, pray for Dylan's mom. So praise the Lord. And Dylan spent some time with his grandparents, so that's why he's not running around the room to the cute building. So I know we miss him running around saying hi to everybody. So, and Tom's out sick. A lot of COVID going around right now. Thank God it's not hospital COVID and, and death COVID, but a lot of people are suffering with you know, colds and stuff coming out of COVID. So hopefully it's not the stigma that it used to be. People can relax in their lives. It's just what I'm trying to do. Very good job. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad you appreciate it. The Daniel's easy to teach, right? It's just, it, when you get the interpretation of the same chapter, it makes it super easy not to come up with anything. The angel gave the interpretation. We're just reading it. <laughs> That's great with scripture. It's nice when the angel gives you the answers. It's like cheating on the exam, but with an angel. So, yeah. <laughs> stands on the sun, can't go wrong there. 
<laughs> All right. So this week, what's coming up? I don't. The youth is going to camp. We pray for them in the service. Uh, keep praying for the youth. Version um, classes are going great. If you're not uh, coming in our midweek classes, come on out this week. We're having some great stuff. How's the church history class going? Pretty good. I didn't know we could go 45 minutes over, though. Oh, yeah. Sure, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Midweek is all bets are off. Just come and relax. Apologetics class is going well. Uh, Ephesians class is going well. Uh, Briggs class on West Life is going well. So it's going to be a great sermon. It's going to be a great sermon. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then we'll open it out. Sorry, we're a little over. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. So Joanne's looking like to put together a group. Uh, Todd Donovan, who's our former music pastor here, is singing the one of the leads in Beauty and the Beast, the performance up at, um, yeah, I mean, that's right into Daniel chapter 7. Todd is the beast. <laughs> so much we can do with that. But Todd is playing the beast um, in a production of Beauty and the Beast up in Tarpon Springs, right? Coming up at the end of the month. If you are interested in going and seeing that, please talk with Joanne as we try to nail down possibly taking a show. Uh, to do that. Um, so we'll get the date out. Is it next Saturday or the following Saturday? Next? So we probably won't have enough time to bring something for this Saturday. Okay, so we're probably looking at the last Saturday of the month, the matinee. Yeah, so not this Saturday, but next Saturday. So if anyone is interested, you can reach out to Joanne, you can reach out to me. If we have enough, then we'll see if we can take a show. Uh, it's a little pricey. What are the tickets? Are $31.50. So, yeah, $31.50. So it's a little pricey. But obviously, if you've ever heard Todd say, he's funny to hear saying, I can imagine he'll have a great time playing the beast in the the beast. So, um, that's probably why his hair's all grown out. I can part of him. And so, yeah. And blonde, he had blue tips. Anyway, so that's an opportunity if you like a musical theater. And, you, and Todd's got such a beautiful voice. If you want to come here, get a hold of either me or Joanne, and we'll get the details. We'll see if we have enough to take a shot with. Uh, if not, maybe we'll do a uh, carpool with or something like that. So. It'll be a matinee performance. I don't know exactly what time, but it's afternoon performance. It's afternoon performance. We'll get the details. We'll have the details next Sunday, or I'll put them out. I'll get them and put them out on Braille. So you can look for it and see if you guys want to go. Yeah, and Jeannie will announce it in Golden Bears as well. Yeah, so. yeah, Jeannie and Tom Brothers. All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Lord God Almighty, we thank you for today. We thank you for the privilege to be in your house. Uh, Lord, we just look forward to your coming, uh, your soon return. We, we want your kingdom to come. Uh, but Lord, uh, while we're here, help us to be faithful servants and do what you've called us to do. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this wonderful passage of prophetic scripture where we can give you praise and honor and glory. For you are the God who lives outside of time. You know the past, the present, and you know our future. And it is a wonderful future that you have in store. Thank you for your angels who are just so matter of fact about human history and so matter of fact about the future that the saints will rule and reign with you eternally. Lord, we just cannot wait for what you have in store for us. Um, but Lord, uh, life on this earth, as you know, you live it. Um, it can be difficult. And so we pray for those who experience loss. Lord, just comfort them in a way that only you can. Comfort them with your Holy Spirit to let them know that you love them. And then we have the great and wonderful hope to see our loved ones again someday very soon. Uh, Lord, for the difficulties of this life, health issues and uh, issues with work and colleagues and family, just the mess of life, Lord, help us through those uh, situations as well. Help us to love one another as, as Pastor Chad exhorted us, um, as your friend John exhorts us in the letter of 1 John and in his gospel. Help us to love one another in a day and age where there's not a lot of love around is just falling into lawlessness and uh, help us to be different, to point people to you, to be joyful souls so that people wonder the source of our joy and we can point to you. Help us to always have uh, an argument and, and a reason uh, for the joy that is within us and that people can be pointed to, to Jesus. Help us to use prophetic scripture to point people to you, and especially as we watch Scripture being fulfilled right in our, just right before our eyes. Uh, help us to acknowledge that, to not be blinded to what you are doing right amongst us at this time. Help us to give you praise and honor and glory as we watch your prophetic word just jump to 